シアベルキャットこれより軍務に復帰します私たちで撃退しましょうここは私たちで食い止めましょう泣き言なんて見捨てられないよね<笑>また大切なものが壊されてたくさんの命が失われるのかな戦車操縦主権車両整備士として登録されましたエーデルワイス号の運転と整備をしますよろしくお願いしますYou know, I've played a little bit of it, but it's like I've never played through the entire game before.、Uh, okay. I am somewhat familiar with the characters.、Uh, as far as Langrisser goes, it's been a long time since they had a collab.、Uh, the You're one, right. <laughs> yeah, the one before this one is actually, was actually Ronin Warriors.、Uh, and, it was and, you know, the big gap is probably because、uh, Gintama was supposed to come out between these two,、yeah. and that never happened, which is very sad. <laughs> it was.、Uh, But yeah,、uh, Valkyrie Chronicles, I'd say like, whether or not it fits Langrisser is pretty like, pretty, pretty, pretty much a no. Because <laughs> it has, like, a, <laughs> has like, yeah, yeah, it has like the, I guess the World War, World War II style aesthetic to it.、Uh, although it also has like magic and stuff in it too. But、uh, so as usual, they've added two SSR characters and one freebie SR character. Before we dive into the characters,、uh, I feel I need to point out once again, there's no new. Time faction buff added this time. Oh. And yeah, it's getting kind of. It's getting kind of bad for a time faction, I would say. Because,、uh, you know, the only. Well, we have three faction buffs, right? We have Yusuke,、uh, Joshua, and Angelica. And it's kind of funny because, like, <laughs> Angelica is kind of considered to be one of the most viable time faction buffs at this point, I feel like. Oh my god. Because she has a very interesting support kit, and you can have her do a number of things. And she actually, I think she actually works pretty well with some of,、uh, with like Silveria or something. But, uh,、okay. Yusuke still is still okay.、Uh, I use Yusuke, but that's only because、uh, I'm a big protagonist box, and Yusuke fits pretty well in there.、Mm -hmm. uh, I would say Joshua is the, is the faction buffer that's having the most trouble for time faction, and not because. Like, the, the, the faction buff effect he has is pretty good. It's AoE damage, and that's still nice. But the big problem、uh, with him is that when he brings the faction buff, he has, like, no space to bring,、uh, yeah. like, his other skills.、Uh, oftentimes, what you do is that you, you do faction buff plus his 1C is probably, like, ninjutsu or something, and then all you have is the one AoE, which is、uh, not that great.、Uh, well, I mean, the, the AoE itself is fine. It's just more that... It means he only has the one and done AoE, and that's pretty bad.、Uh, yeah. The alternative is that you bring like Phantom Raid plus Magic Eye or something,、uh, or, or Dark Demise. And that helps a little bit, but then he doesn't have, but then he can't like walk over terrain, and it's like, eh.、Hey. Yeah. Also, Ninjutsu ups his damage a lot. That's another thing. Yeah, <laughs>、uh, yeah so I, I don't know what they're going to do, because like I,、uh, we know that at some point they're, they're actually going to rerun Yu Yu Hakusho again, which is. Uh, something 
a lot of people never expected to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah they got the permission. Yeah, they reran it like just like just like this past month on the Chinese server. So, well, well I only uh, know one guy. So, woo. Yeah, so hopefully we'll get that on the global server as well. Because uh, that's another thing, right? Because like global and especially with collabs, like the global and uh, Chinese server are going to be different when they run them. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends on the IP, I guess. Uh, I, I don't think... They probably didn't have much trouble getting something like Wataru. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, overall, for the Valkyria Chronicles, these characters, I think a lot of people found them kind of disappointing. I guess that's the thing. Uh, I don't think they're... Well, I mean, aside from Asara, but they're, they're, they're mostly okay, at least. But I guess that's the thing. A lot of people always talk about, well, I don't want to see too much power creep in this game. Or some people say, oh, I want to see power creep in this game because I always want something new to come out. Uh, this is a good example of how when they create stuff that is not ridiculously overpowered, people will complain. <laughs> and then when they do yeah. compl cr create something overpowered, people will be like, oh, this is too overpowered. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I guess uh, we we'll might as well, yeah, I guess we might as well jump into it and like just take a look. Uh, <laughs> we can start with the Sara, which is uh, it's the SR freebie, and SR sucks. She sucks. <laughs> uh, I mean, with these SRs, they keep doing this thing where it, it feels like after what is it, Iris and Close and Olivier, and maybe some some of the ones after that. It's like they gave us some really, really good SRs near the beginning of the game, and then they realized that, that that was bad for the game or bad for their profits or something, and then they just stopped doing that. Because <laughs> they, they kept giving us SRs that are just not that impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it started with, I mean, Kuwabara is still pretty bad. Uh, and I guess they've given, like, they've been a varying quality. Uh, you know, if you want to count Ainz, like, Ainz is he's still okay uh he's SSR, so it's kind of yeah. like yeah Ainz, Ainz, Ainz is one of those weird borderline cases because he was released as an ssr and you can't upgrade him with like the sr like free shards from the slot machine and stuff so like even parn like parn upgrades into ssr when he's six stars but you can upgrade him using like those free sr shards <laughs> so that's and that's what i think a lot of people are going to do and parn is like and parn is not good in pvp but at least he's like at least he's pretty fun to play around with in pve uh, yeah. You know, they gave, like, there was, like, Altina, who was, like, really bad. Uh, <laughs> and it was, like, was a, uh, uh, Toma. Toma was, like, I mean, Toma is, like, on paper, some of the stuff he does is kind of interesting, but then he had, like, bad factions, and he just can't really replace the arm. Uh, Toma's skills are the only good thing about him in, um, which was the, the Rogue, the Rogue C1. Uh, wait, what? And the uh, the rogue uh, ocean thing. I use a lot of his uh oh his skills and his um ability. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like the yeah, and the 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 rogue like mode. Yeah, you can do all kinds of crazy. Yeah, but, but, but by himself, you no. Know. <laughs> by himself, like I mean, we talked about him in the past, but Tomo like kind of had some like he had some interesting ideas to him, but they didn't quite give him exactly what he needed. And then there was like. <laughs> and then there was, uh, what was it, Shibaraku. Shibaraku was actually surprisingly good. Uh, like, I, I almost feel like that was on accident. Because <laughs> uh, they kept giving us uh, SRs that are just kind of like, eh. Uh, and then here comes Shibaraku, who's just like, eh, he's actually kind of, he actually has some, like, niche uses. Uh, so now we come to Isara for uh, Valkyria Chronicles. So to their credit, they at least tried something kind of unique with her. So she's kind of like this. She's like a, she's like a tank that also has some AOE reduction for your party, uh, and she actually has a heal as well, which is something that uh, tanks don't really have. Uh, and then she has like a couple of uh, AOE skills and some support skills. So she's kind of like a weird, weird hodgepodge of support yeah. and off tanking and even a little bit of healing. So. Uh, and really the problem here is that I think she's spread a little bit too thin and she yeah, can't really yeah. do anything all that well. She, uh, you know, she's probably okay at tanking physical hits. She only has Lance Phalanx to tank for other allies, so uh, she's not very flexible in that sense. Uh, she has like this weird thing where her talent says uh, she reduces AoE damage 
in from line skills if people are standing behind her. So, uh, I mean, it's kind of fun. Like, it's I guess it's a cool idea. Like, you're, you're like hiding behind a tank, you're taking cover behind her. Yeah. But it's obviously it's a little bit too limiting because uh, yeah, it only works on line skills. It, you know, it's like you have to be standing behind her. And it's like, eh, it's 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 kind of neat as a gimmick, but uh, it it should have been. Like, if they wanted this to be useful, then they probably should have done something like, uh, y like, you have to be behind her and maybe, like, up or down one block, you know what I mean? Like, so that she can cover maybe three lines worth of mm -hmm. melee. Something like that, I don't know. Because cause as is, it's like, it, it's, I guess it's kind of interesting, but uh, not that useful. Uh, her heal is, like, I mean, it's a pretty, like, it's an attack-based heal. Uh, and then it gives like a regeneration effect, which is, yeah, that's nice. Uh, yeah. It, is, it is a nice heal spell, but it's like, you, you know, why would I use her it, when she doesn't? The thing is, like off healers. Uh, when you think of off healers, it's uh, they usually are. You are taking the fact that they are healing on top of some other role they're doing, right? Yeah. So Mariel, of course, is like kind of the like one of the big go-to examples that she she's just doing so much, right? She heals you, and then she can be basically an assassin and she's a pretty good dps uh and even uh you know last time we talked about uh lisa and you know lisa she she can heal and she can fight uh isara she is supposed to be healing and tanking at the same time which is i actually think that could be cool because i've actually made a build like that in the roguelike mode before like i i make i use like i use like valkyrie freya who has int as her like attack stat so she has relatively oh. high int so i give her like a heal spell and she can like heal herself that's cool uh and you know it's a it's it's not a bad idea but it's just like isara like well i mean she has the same limitation a lot of sr tanks says that she can't tank magic uh and you wouldn't want her to anyway uh and i guess there's just the general uh, idea that tanks are not that great in the meta right now uh or at least the, or at least the tanks that are good have a lot more they can do other than just take hits yeah uh you know she can't she can reduce the aoe damage from a line skill but then she doesn't have like a group heal or something if she had like an aoe heal i think that might be a little bit more useful because then it's like right you can heal back up yeah yeah because because like then you can say like okay she's both tanking single targets and reducing aoe damage and then she heals up your team like that 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 could be kind of cool uh, they also gave her like a number of attack skills, even her 3C is an attack, and it, it's basically, they're like support attack skills, basically, they, like, they're like reduce the enemy's stats or something, uh, you know, reduce their attack or reduce their defense or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's, the debuffs are not that useful, and she's not going to be doing that much damage because she has no offensive boosts of any kind. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's just, uh, she's just like... She's a she has like a unique combination of things she can do, but she's bad at all of them. <laughs> I guess is the point. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you know, like I did actually play with her a bit, and that that's only because, uh, she, as usual, she's the bonus unit. She's one of the bonus units in the uh, like the Secret Realm event for Valkyria Chronicles. So yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I mean, you can raise her a little bit just to get some extra points, like if you don't have the other characters for that event. But yeah, it's like I I just don't even I just don't see the point of her even from the perspective of like someone who is doing sr only accounts because i know some people do that yeah uh, you know it's, uh, just for fun or just to challenge yourself uh even yeah. um, even comparing her to her to her peers in sr like she just seems really bad to me like i would actually i would actually even use like someone like kuwabara over here because like kuwabara is actually like kuwabara is actually surprisingly like like he has really good longevity if you get, get him into the right space because uh, he heals himself over and over, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Isara just doesn't do anything all that well. Uh, and she's, she's just kind of bad. She's bad. She's good at dying, uh, which I guess is on brand for her. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't. Know. Do, do you see anything on Isara that you think might be interesting? I don't really see anything. Oh, the only the only thing I feel the need to point out is like the unique sprite they gave her. They did she does like have a little tank sprite, and that's cute. And it's oh, and it just yeah, feels yeah. like it feels like such a waste, right? Because it's yeah. like, they go to the trouble of like getting the art guy to to make this cool little tank sprite. Uh, it's just like it's used on this character that I don't think anybody is going to use. 
uh and her factions are bad too it says strategic masters in time uh, i don't know why they keep doing this thing where they give them like only you know they're bad enough already why do you only give them two factions and you give them two factions that aren't used that often uh it's the same faction combination as toma so it's like yeah uh i mean strategic masters might get a buff in the future uh we don't know because it's, it seems like, I, I feel like Strategic Masters is one of the factions that's going to be up for a buff soon. Uh, there's been rumors floating around that maybe Lamford might get an SP class, uh, but nobody knows. And yeah, for I mean, just looking at it for the moment, it's just like nothing, there's nothing going for Asara. She has bad factions, her skills just are not good, her talent is really narrow. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know that's pretty brutal, but... <laughs> It's, it's, you gotta blame Zalone for this stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you don't have anything to say, like, let's, let's move I, on. I Steve. don't. Yeah, let's just, okay. Well, we'll, t we'll talk about the banner character. So, uh, we can start with the protagonist here, Alicia. Uh, so of the two, I would say Alicia is the better one. Uh, I think Alicia is good. Uh, I'm definitely gonna try to get her, uh, you know, protagonist, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think one thing worth noting about Alicia is that she's the first archer uh, that's worth using uh, who is not just an assassin that's pretending to be an archer. Ooh. It's like she's she's an archer, but she doesn't have a guard pierce or anything like that. She's just like she's just an archer class, and she does like very straightforward attacks. Uh, she doesn't have a guard pierce. She doesn't have repost or shadow raid or anything like that. Because every other archer that is relevant has some kind of guard pierce, right? Uh, yeah, you know, like obviously illustrial. She just pierces guard, uh, and I mean, I guess I guess there's Suzette. Suzette does AOEs, and she, even Suzette has a repost. I believe she did. Uh, she had a guard pierce of some kind. I forgot which one it was. But yeah, uh, so but Alicia is an archer, and she does not have any sort of guard pierce, and. Uh, well, as uh, as was expected, she is protagonist because she is like the leading lady of the of Valkyrie, uh, Valkyrie Chronicles, and they also gave her uh, well, time faction is obvious because she's crossover, and and uh, the last faction is actually mythical, which uh, which fits her plus the fact that uh, that is actually a really really common combination on these protagonist characters because. Especially, especially like even like if you just limit yourself to protagonist characters that are also the time faction. Like you have Yusuke, who is also mythical. You have Rin, who is also mythical. Uh, so yeah, like like this is uh, it's it's a good faction to it's a good faction that they gave her, uh, and it makes sense anyway. So uh, the way I would sum up Alicia is that she's kind of like a mix of single target and AOE. And she can kind of, she sort of does both at the same time, uh, which fits really well into the way I think protagonist plays right now, which is that they have sort of like a hybrid box. Like at least I'm playing like a hybrid box. I mean, you can focus more into single target or AOE uh, by swapping out certain characters in the protagonist box right now. Uh, but having a character like this who can kind of do both at the same time is very useful. Uh, so. I guess uh, I'll just start by talking about her talent. So uh, first, Alicia, so attack boost. Uh, so like no damage boost by default in her talent, but uh, she has Terrain Master, which sure, why not? Like so many units have Terrain Master nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So the most unique part of her talent is this thing where she, she when she's moving through units or blocks within one block of those units, she will gain... Uh, up to three blocks of basically the illustrial style, uh, like free blocks, free blocks of movement, and this applies to both uh, allied units and enemy units. Okay, so and if she walks through people, uh, when if she walks through people and then attacks using a single target skill or an AOE skill, uh, she will gain uh, a unique buff that gives her uh, damage dealt, damage taken minus. Uh, and it can be stacked up two times. So basically, the idea here is that you want to engage with her by walking through two units. Uh, and when you do that, 
Uh, not only does she do a lot more damage, but she will be very, very tanky. Like, damage taken minus 40% uh, oh. from the talent alone. And, and of course, being an archer, she will probably also have last right, so she'll be very, very tanky. Uh, Ooh, yeah, definitely. And uh, it only lasts one turn, so she's only ta she's only like so she's kind of like a it's a very like a shock trooper, I guess, kind of uh, approach because she's only going to be very strong for that one turn, and then this talent goes on cooldown for well two turns at six stars, but uh, even though two turns is not that long. Uh, you know, once once that buff drops, it's gonna be pretty. It's probably gonna be a lot easier to kill her. So the idea is that you know you want to engage with her uh, by walking through a certain number of enemies, and she'll be very tanky. Uh, you can't dispel this. You can't dispel like the talent buff, so uh, it'll be pretty hard to kill her, uh, and she'll probably do a fair amount of damage. And uh, obviously, it depends on what kind of skill loadout you bring on her as to whether or not you did single target or AOE. Uh, so as far as this uh, this this whole like illustrial style of movement she has, so uh, it does update the da the danger zone does update based on uh, based off of this. So if there are okay. if there are units arranged so that there are some in the front and she's in the back, like and you're fighting against her, you're still going to see her having like that really really big move range. You don't have to completely worry about uh, being totally blindsided by just how far she's moving because. The game will display like her basic movement, uh, and it will consider the talent as well. But uh, she does have a cold blood style skill. Uh, I guess we can get into that. But, and, and she's probably going to bring this as her one C pretty much all the time. Yeah, that sounds really so, good. Yeah, so it's like now it, it heals her fifty percent life. So it's, that's that that is very nice because uh, when you consider how tanky she is after her first engage, so she will you know she'll engage. She'll probably do a lot of damage, and then she'll be very tanky. If you try to attack her, uh, it's going to be kind of hard to kill her. But then the next turn, uh, she might be able to just use this and heal back up yep. a lot of what damage you did to her. It depends on if she used it the previous turn, I guess. Oh, actually, not 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 really, because if she uses this and then attacks, then this is uh, this is actually back up again because it only has a one turn cooldown. <laughs> it's just definitely going to worry about that thing. Okay, so uh, so uh, this skill. So obviously, like cold blood style skills are not uh, factored in when you're looking at uh, danger zone. So uh, you do want to be careful of that when you're facing her. If somebody puts Alicia way in the back and then they have one unit in the front, and then you look at the danger zone, it doesn't look like she's in range, but she might actually be in range if she used this and then like walk through that ally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the one thing I would look out for when I'm playing against her. Uh. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's all I have to say about the one C. It's it's a cold blood skill and it heals herself. Uh, and I, I guess like uh, it does have it has it can only be used three times total per map. So this is kind of another gimmick to her, which is that instead of having skills that have like cooldowns, or I mean they they still have cooldowns, but a lot of her skills are basically they have very low cooldowns or no uh, or even no cooldown. But yeah. they have a certain number of charges you can use them for. So basically, she has ammo to her skills instead of uh, very long cooldowns. Yeah. So uh, the most common thing, uh, the most common kit she is going to bring is going to be this cold blood skill, uh, her three C, and then the two ski. This the two C skill will either be an AOE or a single target. So I guess we can talk about the two Cs first. Uh, you have. A single target called Barrage, which is just her like shooting her gun, and the I like, I like it's um, it's like on two. It's just a gun, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then the the other two C is uh, she throws a grenade, which is the AOE, right? Which has a grenade. <laughs> yeah. So, the uh, so the so the single target skill, uh, you know, it's 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 not it's not something too special. It is one point four times damage, critical hit rate plus twenty percent, and. Uh, so it has it just actually has zero cooldown. So this is actually really strong in a PvP setting because it means you get to skill three turns in a row. And uh, after you use up the three charges, it becomes a reload skill where she has to like well she really she has to reload her gun, and then she can start use it three times again. Uh, so yeah, like I said, this is really strong in PvP just because like being able to use a skill over and over is uh, really nice. Uh, I mean, it's like it's like uh, with Light of Genesis, right? Light of Genesis can use her one C's or like her basic attack skills over and over, and it helps keep 
keep up the pressure against uh, an opponent. Yeah. And uh, given the way I think Alicia will be played, like I think, like she's probably not going to reload all that often. She's she's probably going to be either dead or the game's going to be over by the time she runs out of ammo. Uh, generally speaking, anyway. Uh, so that's yeah. that's the single target. The the AOE is a grenade skill. So uh, it's AOE damage. Uh, it's a plus sign AOE. So it's a pretty small AOE. But uh, the main function of this is like the damage is nice. But the main function of it is actually that it actually like it's a plus sign AOE and then it blasts people apart. Uh, so in yeah. the, in the directions that like they are on the plus sign of. Uh, so so obviously the idea behind this is that this is this is made to break tank push. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. if yeah. If your opponent is like huddling around a tank, you throw the grenade and everybody gets spread out, and they can't, they probably can't get everybody back into guard range uh, before. Well, that is uh, before like yeah devious. before somebody else comes in and kills somebody, right? So uh, yeah, I mean that's that's th this is a this is a pretty good skill, and uh, <laughs> and as oft as as we so often run into, uh, you got to ban Hilda for this to work. Uh, you know, Hilda. <laughs> She just comes up over and over. A lot of times when we talk about these characters, it's like uh, you know you gotta ban Hilda for it to work. Uh, you know Hilda Hilda is still like the most useful tank overall, I would say. Yep. Uh, so yeah, like if you if you are facing a tank push, uh, I don't I, I don't I don't think there's a lot to say here. Like it is a random it is random between one to two blocks away from uh, the blast zone. So I guess if you're unlucky, they will all get only get knocked away one block, and if your opponent's one block guard or two block guard is still up, they're still going to be guarding every single one of them. So it's probably still ideal if you wait until the guard goes down, uh, which isn't always going to happen because uh, you know, like uh, Christiane has like has two range guard all the time unless you dispel her. But uh, if you play protagonist, you probably have Elwyn in there. You probably have Waytam in your box. So, you're you probably can dispel lots of stuff. Uh, yep. So yeah, like it, it's it's a good utility skill, and it you know also does damage. It's like, it's like 0.3 AOE damage is like moderate damage, so it's not bad. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's the two C. Like she is pretty much always going to choose between one of these two, uh, either the single target or the AOE. Uh, so finally, we can come to our three C. So. So compared to someone like Emperor Lovina, like Emperor Lovina, one of the things I brought up about him is the fact that because his 3C is an AoE, it kind of, it kind of like shoehorned him into preferring to play as an AoE character most of the time. Uh, yeah. Alicia doesn't really have that problem because her 3C is kind of a combination of a of a single target and AoE at the same time, okay. uh, which is which is pretty useful. Uh, cool. So first of all. This is <laughs> the single target portion of this is yet another sword soul clone basically. Uh, yes. <laughs> so being an archer, so like this is this is weaker than a sword soul because it only does 1.9 times damage instead of uh, what was it one point? I think it was 1.8 that sword soul does. It was either 1.0 or 1.9. I, I forgot exactly, but uh, so this is weaker than a standard like sword soul clone. But it has a number of effects on it, which is probably why they justified making it slightly weaker. First of all, uh, it ignores melee. Yeah. So first of all, it ignores melee penalties, uh, which makes sense. She is an archer, and I guess they didn't want to. They didn't want to shoehorn. They didn't want to like force you into playing extreme magic bow if you didn't want to. Yeah. Uh, so uh, before entering battle, restores 100% HP, so she can be injured and still use the skill uh, to good effect. Uh, so dispel five buffs, <laughs> like well, kind of expect that at this point. Defense minus thirty percent. So this is actually really good. Uh, you know, like when you think of something like Sword Soul, it does a lot of damage and it does heal block, but uh, you know the heal block isn't actually improving the actual like the damage of the skill itself, right? So in this case, yeah. you have defense minus thirty percent, which is really really like that's really strong. Uh, that is more than a standard defense down. Uh, of course, the the big oversight here is, of course, if you run into somebody with Overlord badge, uh, this is not going to work on them. But still, like uh, you know, I, this kind of compensates for the fact that it does less. 
it has a lower multiplier than most Sword Soul clones, is that it does defense minus 30%. Okay. Uh, what is it? Okay, so so after she does like this Sword Soul Light, <laughs> she will then do uh, an AoE of four blocks along the line of the target. So uh, it is a 0.25 AoE, so it's not a particularly strong AoE, but it's nice that she kind of like is that her kit, her her single target or AOE uh, determination is more from her two C than her three C because you can still use this as an AOE attack basically. Okay. Uh, I mean, it is only one line, but uh, that's still useful, uh, yeah. especially if you're especially like in an AOE rush if you're looking to kill a specific target, which is usually like the healer or something. You're usually looking to kill like the healer or or some kind of kill some kind of win condition unit uh, that is not the tank. Uh, yeah. then, you know, you could just you could just adjust where you are appropriately. I don't know, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. It's kind of a, like I said, single target AoE rolled into one, and then you can decide with her 2C whether, you want, whether or not you want more single target or more AoE. Uh, I guess the only other thing to talk about with Alicia is her weapon choice. Because... Uh, uh, there's a lot, I mean, there's uh, quite a few choices for archers, right? So, uh, you, you of course have Extreme Magic Bow, uh, which they did not encourage as much with the 3C being able to ignore melee penalty. But yeah. I think it's still useful uh, if you want her to, uh, for example, counter. Like, when you charge in and after you use your 3C or your first skill, if you, if you want to be able to punish your opponent for using a melee attacker on Alicia to try to weaken her. Uh, having an extreme magic bow is obviously useful in that situation because you'll counter for more damage. Uh, Crystal Dagger is obviously like the big one that I think most people are going to use on her because... Uh, You're right, yeah. Well, it depends, right? Like, if you are more AoE focused, you will not be using Crystal Dagger, probably, mm -hmm. because it has no attack boost. Uh, the the defense ignore effect is only for single target, so that's actually a really important thing to keep in mind. Is like if you want her AOE damage to be boosted, uh, the Crystal Stinger is actually kind of a bad choice on her. But it you know the defense ignore is pretty big if you want her to be able to bust a tank with her three C, which I think she can do. Like she she is I think she is strong enough to kill tanks. Uh, you know it really depends on the matchup. But yeah, uh, and then there's finally, there's actually that that bow that just came out on the uh, the Chinese server. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the future, but you can look it up right now. Uh, it should be on the site already. It's called the Lurker's Piercer. Yeah, Lurker's Piercer. So, uh, hit plus 10%, HP plus 5 when moving 3 or less blocks. Physical damage skills when entering battle have a range of plus 1. It's like unit range. Yeah, so uh, we'll talk about this more in the future, but basically this is a kind of... It's similar to Uller's Bow, but instead of for normal attacks, it's for skill attacks. And it doesn't have... And it doesn't have, like, the... It doesn't have the damage penalty that Uller's Bow has. Uh, instead of giving you extra crit rate, which... So it's just... Uh, and you have to move less than three blocks to get the effect. Uh, which doesn't, cool. which isn't too hard for Alicia, because she does have her act against skill, which is uh, two blocks. Uh, uh, you do have to arrange your units in the right way, so to make sure you can approach your enemy in the right way. Uh, but uh, that skill, of course, would make it so that you can instead use her three C from three range, or even use her barrage skill from three range, okay. which I think is like is that that's actually pretty valuable. I think those are the main weapons you would be choosing between for her so extreme magic bow uh this new lurker's bow basically or the crystal stinger dagger those are the big ones uh yeah it really i think it really depends i don't think there's like a single best choice for her i think it really depends on what you want to focus on if you want a very strong like tank busting ability you would go with crystal stinger if you want uh a more balanced uh a more balanced choice it would be extreme magic bow and if you want extra range for single target skills it would be the lurker's bow 
uh, yeah. So overall, like Alicia, you know, she has, you know, like I said, she is an she is a DPS with some single target, some AOE, and she has like some team disruption using her grenade, and she's fairly tanky. Uh, good movement range. Uh, I will say, like the thing about her movement range is that you do need someone out front in front of the rest of your party to be able to take advantage of it, right? Because she needs to walk through someone. Yeah. So, uh, for protagonists at least, that's not too hard to accomplish, I think, because you know you have a number of units in the protagonist who run forward. Uh, Elwyn runs forward. Uh, Waytam not only runs forward, but he actually puts down his sword. So you know you can you can you can use the sword. You can walk through the sword as well. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, Emperor Lovina usually charges forward. Uh, so yeah, like as far as protagonists go. I think you have a fair number of choices for uh, someone basically taking point for the rest of the group. Uh, for Mythical, I mean, Mythical also has Waytam, so uh, they have Juggler, of course. Uh, who else do they have? Uh, I guess you get like, I guess like there's like Gizaroth. Uh There's Kruger, like Kruger's, like Kruger sometimes is like, we'll just charge in because he has a shield. Uh, yeah. You can use Console of the Moon, who, who charges for it. Uh, you can, there's Azusa, who comes out later. Uh, so, or even Bernhard, actually. Bernhard is, Bernhard is pretty tanky. Uh, the big problem with this sort of strategy where you have someone out front and then, like, have people in the back who kind of use them, because, like, for protagonists, there's actually, like, I already do that right now without Alicia because uh, Wataru uses that. Wataru needs someone to hook to to be able to charge forward. So a lot of times, like I will have some someone out front, like usually, usually it's like Landius or something. But like I would say, like the big downside to that is that uh, you need to ban characters like Sherry because Sherry can act against her. She can kind of like, if you are doing what I'm saying when you place one guy forward, is that Sherry can kind of run forward and just bounce off of the guy out front and then run way to the back and then kill your guys. Uh, yeah, so that's 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 the annoying thing about Sherry. And then then there's also like like Waytam. It also makes it easier for uh, opponent Waytams to engage you because uh, if you have someone out front then it's easier for them to drop the sword and they'll have somebody to well Waytam can like Waytam can teleport uh to the person you just hit and then if he breezes then he can also run to the back wait way to the back where your guys are and kill them. Uh, so there's a lot of units like that. So that's really the big problem with units like uh, Alicia. Yeah, I, that's about all I have to say about Alicia. Do you have anything you want to add here? Man, I do. I just I like her. I mean, she's a, a an actual archer. Yes, uh, an actual archer archer that's going to be useful in PvP. Uh, I mean, she is definitely not like a must-have unit or anything because I think protagonist units are still kind of in an awkward place because. Uh, Emperor Lovina was not some kind of uh, super busted unit that everybody needed to have. So, uh, Protagonist is still kind of a dead faction to a lot of people unless you happen to be running Emperor Lovina. Yeah. Uh, mythical faction is doing okay. But Time faction, like we said at the beginning, like Time faction is kind of having a lot of trouble right now because they, they're, yeah. still, they're, still, they're so stubborn about not adding new Time faction buffers, which is very strange. Uh, and speaking of time faction buffers, uh, this next character really should have been one, in my opinion. Uh, we have Silveria, who is uh, oh. who is one of the big villains from uh, Valkyria Chronicles. Uh, so Silveria, a lot of people are disappointed with her, not only because I like she's not that great, but also because her the role they gave her in Langrisser does not really fit her at all. So she's kind of like a sniper kind of character. So in Valkyria Chronicles, she's like a, she's like one of the big generals of the yeah. anta antagonists, and I she can has tell. <laughs> uh, begging more ways than one. Uh, so so she Ooh. has, and she has like the, you know certain like magic powers and stuff, and uh, and they do uh, reference that in her skills. So uh, I guess we can start by talking about her talent. Oh, like by the way, like <laughs> it's funny because like uh, the few times I've, I've talked about Severia with some people on like Discord and stuff, and. Uh, <laughs> One person I talk to keeps referring to her as a shittier Zerida, <laughs> uh, which I, I think is kind of true, but like we'll, we'll see that in a second here. So first, uh, the talent. You got crit rate and crit damage. Uh, pretty standard stuff. Uh, I don't like... 
I, I'm always a little bit uh, skeptical of critical hit rate and critical damage talents because you got so many things nowadays that are there to annoy critical uh, critical hit characters. You know, you got Hilda yeah. who just uh, who just like straight up uh, kills. Denies. Yeah, denies crit, and then you have all these auras from like Christiane and Landius. Uh, I mean, you're not always going to run into them, so it's not it's not the worst thing. And, you know, there's plenty of crit characters that do just fine. It's just that it's annoying that you have to always roll the dice against uh, these auras. Uh, and it really comes down to preference, because I know one of my guildies who plays a lot of assassins, he says that, like, sometimes he actually prefers to fight Hilda just because, like, that's more under your control. Because, like, with Hilda, like, okay, I'll just hit her once and then and then use my assassins. Because with when you fight Landius or Christiane, it's like... Every single time I attack, I need to pray that I don't get like that twenty percent chance or whatever that my crit fails and I'm sad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, like, so her talent is actually very bare bones. So now she has this crit rate and crit damage boost, and then she has this thing where it's like if you end your turn within five blocks of her at six stars, uh, and you have full life, you will take fixed damage from her attack. So, basically what the way to design Silveria is that she has, like, she's basically kind of like a sniper. Like I said, she has some really long-range abilities that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but I guess this is, sort of, this is sort of like the opposite end of that, where if you approach her too rapidly, she will instead chunk you with this fixed damage. Which I guess is kind of nice, but it's, to me it doesn't seem particularly useful unless you have a tank. Uh, because... The, the main use I see for this is that uh, if you a chunk like uh, like what is it 1.5 times attack of Silveria onto somebody getting close like whether it's like Waytam like because five blocks is a lot so like Waytam will probably be in range uh, you know Sherry uh, you know after after she does her first attack or she might be in range. Uh, or even uh, Elwyn, assuming he's not wearing a bracer, because this is not like an unresistible fixed damage. So yeah. Elwyn will Elwyn will take some damage. So 1.5 times attack is probably enough to kill maybe one or two soldiers, I would say. Uh, and obviously it will break last rites and stuff as well. So the idea here, I think, is more just to make it so that uh, Silveria can hide under a tank and play her sniper role. And if your opponent tries to rapidly approach you, she will instead just uh, punish them by doing fixed damage to their soldiers and maybe making them lose one or two soldiers. And if they try to kill your tank while they're missing one or two soldiers, they're probably not going to succeed. That's that's the main thing I see here. If your opponent is using AoEs, then I, I don't think this is you know this is obviously not doing much for you because like if Wei Tam comes in with his AoE, then I don't think he really cares that he get he got chunked a bit. I mean, it's going to break his last rights for you to go on a counter attack a little bit easier but uh yeah this is a very this seems like a very strange strangely underpowered talent uh, uh i guess we could talk about her factions real quick she has empire and strategic masters which is a pretty standard combo uh you know those those two get bundled together pretty often uh we make fun of strategic masters a lot but i think like empire is really really good empire is arguably the best faction right now uh yeah and uh, strategic masters is still okay like especially when it's paired with empire so i think her factions are fine so okay let's get into her skills because i think the problem here is that silveria is very very one-dimensional so uh looking at her 1c and 2c skills first uh her 1c skills like you're probably you're you're usually going to go for either detect or her uh her unique passive ambush so both of these are basically just like stat boosts uh, the only difference is that the one the unique one she has is she needs to be on defensive terrain so if you are on a map where you feel like you're not going to be able to easily get her into a forest or whatever then yeah just use the attack instead uh and then for her 2c you are probably going to use either just like a second attack or you are going to use her uh, this command skill she has which is basically just like it's basically like a crappier version of mass attack and mass protect and stuff uh, the upside of this is that 
it's several of those rolled into one skill, so you can choose which buff you want. And it even has critical hit rate plus 20% as a, as a buff, uh, which is uh, something that doesn't really exist. So that's, that's actually pretty nice if you are running a very crit-reliant team. Uh, the big downside to this skill is that there are no immunities bundled in, as you can see. So the attack boost does not have the silence immunity like mass attack does, and uh, you know, hey. same same thing with the rest of them. So that's actually a really big downside. Uh, but it's still nice that she can kind of play as like a team enabler if you need her to, you know. But yeah, that's that's all I have to say about her one C and two C. It's like it's her her one C and two C skill set seems very basic. Uh, her in, basically. Her entire kit, uh, to me, is completely centered around her 3C here. Okay. Which is... So basically, she roots herself in place. Uh, I, it's a it's a two-part skill, like uh, like, Zerida's, like Zerida's 3C or Sigma's 3C. So it's like it's like a, it's like a self-buff in the first part, and then it turns into an attack, and then it can turn back into the self-buff again. So... Okay. The first part, she just roots herself in place... Uh, she can't move. She can't. Uh, she gets critical hit rate plus twenty percent. She gets plus seven range, uh, and she does less damage the closer somebody is. Uh, and probably most annoyingly, she can't be teleported in this state, which is pretty annoying. Okay. Uh, because it would have been nice if you could like sit her down and then teleport her into uh, into a spot where you can. Uh, do her stipe ability yeah uh, but they didn't allow you to do that uh, she can be acted again she just can't move or move again uh but anyway like okay so she gets plus seven range so she has nine range and then the second part of the skill is just an attack it says uh ignores it ignores guard 1.4 times damage and if they are at least nine spaces away <laughs> so basically the max range uh, yeah you will do 20% extra damage, and then you will do a direct hero attack. So okay. this is so this is why <laughs> some people I were talking to were kind of like jokingly referring to her as a crappier Zerida, because it's very similar, right? You're kind of you're taking one turn to set up, and then the next turn you attack the hero directly, and it's very very unlikely that most units will survive this because she's pretty strong. Uh, you know, you got 30% crit damage, 20% damage to the hero. Uh, it's a 1.4 times damage, uh, you know, direct hero hit. It's probably pretty hard for most units to survive this, uh, even if they're under, like, a Landius RR or something. Uh, I mean, I, I guess there might be some super tanky units that might survive this, but usually a direct hero attack like this is is fatal so this has the same flaws that zerda has where it's like after you set up the counterplay is to move out of the way yeah <laughs> uh arguably it's even worse than zerda because zerda once she sets up if you are closer to her she can still do the same thing you have to run yeah. away from her for for silveria if you get closer to her she is doing less damage the closer you are and, and she also doesn't do the direct hero attack anymore. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, she could, like, if, if it's a frail unit, she'll probably just kill them anyway. And, you know, she does have uh, Dark Elf Snipers if you want to be attacking a 100% HP target. Uh, I think usually she's probably going to be using Faceless Soldiers because uh, uh, if you are dealing with Alandius or Christian Aura, you can use the Faceless Soldiers to reduce their crit evasion. Uh, mm -hmm. Sil Silveria herself, uh, she can reach 100% crit rate pretty easily, I think. So it's like 30% crit rate from her talent. You get uh, either, what is it, 10 to 15% crit rate from her passive. And then uh, her Archer class has uh, a base 31% crit rate. So, uh, what is it? Yeah, and then, and then you could have like, uh, what is it... Uh, critical hit rate plus 20% from her 3C's buff, and uh, you're probably going to be equipping like uh, Crystal Dagger or something, which is also critical hit rate and critical damage. Uh, you can also use like that new bow that we just talked about because that does work with this 3C, so instead she can shoot 10 spaces away. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, 
it's also 10 percent what is it yeah 10 10 crit rate on that thing so uh overall it's like it's like really really easy to hit 100 percent crit rate on her yeah so the only thing you need to fear is uh crit evasion uh which uh you just give her faceless and it will help with that uh she unfortunately can't get uh epsilon's buff which is actually a huge uh detriment to her because uh Epsilon's buff, uh, of course, reduce, uh, reduces the enemy's crit evade. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because yeah, because that's that's one of the reasons Epsilon's buff is actually really really strong. If you use a lot of assassins, because like it, it it makes it so that Landius and Christiana Aura is less of a concern. Okay. Uh, so overall, like, I don't think there's a lot I can else I can say about Silveria because. Like the description of she's a crappier Zerda isn't entirely inaccurate. Uh, I think she has some things that are better than Zerda. Like she doesn't, she doesn't need to be scared of the danger zone. That's that's like that's one really annoying thing about playing Zerda. It's like she always needs to go hide uh, outside the danger zone, which is very very difficult to do sometimes. Uh, yeah. I I think in terms of like kill power i think zerida might still be better than silveria like zerida is still i think the single strongest assassin in terms of just killing stuff uh, but i don't think silveria should be having too much trouble killing the majority of targets right now i guess the final thing that she doesn't have that zerida does have is the faction buff uh, oh yeah and that's why i said she really should have gotten a faction buff because at least then that, like, that would be something uh that, that would be yeah. something, like you know i, I kind of feel like it time faction is long overdue for another buff uh i know they i know some people are like a little bit hesitant for there to be four buffs for each faction but it's like and and that's arguably that's part of the reason empire is good but not really because like it's not like anybody ever uses lance anyway <laughs> yeah uh so, so, but like for time faction they kind of are found in a similar situation right because it's they technically already have three buffs but you would never use uh i mean i guess all three of them have their uses but you would not use all three of them together because yusuke and joshua are buff two completely opposite ends of how a box functions uh yeah. you know one is aoe and one is single target uh angelica oh yeah i mentioned this earlier i guess i might as well uh mention it right now because like angelica if you combine her with silveria uh you can use her to like convert silveria's class <laughs> and then and then uh, oh. ki kill kill whatever target you're trying to kill right like that is one <laughs> thing i can see you doing with angelica yeah silveria like there really isn't a lot to say about her i feel like because like her kit isn't something super unique that we haven't seen before and it's not even a terrible kit or anything but it is one of those things where it feels like this feels very outdated compared to some of the units that they've released. And yeah. I think this is why some people found Valkyria Chronicles kind of disappointing. Because Silveria is just kind of like, eh, she's okay, I guess. And uh, I think most people are not go going to bother with her because there's just so many better choices. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't... I can't really see anything else to really talk about here. Uh, I mean, she does have an infantry class, but I don't think uh, uh, I don't think you are ever going to be using her infantry class. Uh, it actually has, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it actually has less attack and less skill than her archer class, which is very strange. Uh, usually, usually the uh, the infantry class, like the trade-off, is that you get more attack uh, in exchange for being infantry. Uh, but they didn't yeah. do that in, the, in this case. She's just she's just tankier in her infantry class, so it just feels like okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't got anything else to say. Do you? Do you, you have anything you want to say here? Not really. <laughs> uh, I just if I pull her, then okay. If I get Alicia, yay. When it comes down to it, a lot of times when we talk about a character being okay. The thing that I don't mention a whole lot is the, just the idea that, yeah, she's fine, and yeah, she can do, like, you know, you, you can think of all kinds of things on paper, and we'll actually talk about that a lot more once we talk about Grenier in a second, but uh, it also comes down to, like, why invest in a character like this 
as opposed to one of the other characters that exists. Uh, yeah. Because Empire is really, really stacked right now. Like, you got Lucretia, you have Iron Chancellor, you have Bernhardt, uh, you know, even someone like Autocrado or Ares is still good. Uh, or, or like Vin or even Vincent, like Vincent is good. Uh, there's just so many characters for you to be raising in Empire right now. And like, I do think that uh, if you if you are p playing nothing but Empire, uh, I do believe she offers something unique because I don't believe Empire actually had that many assassins in their ranks. Uh, if you if you are just playing like pure Empire, which I don't think most people do, because most people. Because right now, if people want an assassin, they throw Epsilon in their box, and Epsilon is kind of like good no matter what box it is, because he just buffs himself anyway, so who cares. Uh, and having Epsilon in your box kind of open, opens up for you to be able to put other Meteor Strike characters in your box. Yeah. But, I mean, like I said, the bow that comes out like um, like two months later, uh, it's I, I think it's clearly like those, those pieces of equipment are a little bit meant to be used with these characters and you know that, that that does help her out a little bit she gets the plus one she gets the plus one uh range which is very useful and that's about it <laughs> yeah so uh, i guess uh just to recap a little bit alicia and silveria uh alicia is like neither one of them is like terrible or anything and alicia i would say is better than silveria in a general sense but Alicia is cursed with the protagonist faction, which is still kind of niche, even after Emperor Lovina was added. Uh, Silveria is just, like, she's also pretty niche. Like, she, her factions are fine, for the most part. Uh, but she, she plays a role that I don't think is particularly useful at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, you know, the meta can always shift, and in the future, some unit that didn't used to be good will be good, will be good again. Like, that's, that's yeah. happened before. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately for, uh, Valkyria Chronicles fans, uh, they did not decide this time to create, like, some super busted, uh, oh, <laughs> characters. Uh, I will say, like, looking back on some of the collabs there have been, uh, I would say this is, this is, this fares better than, like, Overlord. I would say, like, Overlord is probably the weakest collab in terms of, like, how much it affected, uh, the overall meta. Yeah. Like, uh, like, Ainz, I mean, Ainz was, like, Ainz is Ainz, like, he's, he's a freebie, but Albedo was, like, kind of a niche pick for a while, and she's still kind of useful. Like, Albedo can still be really annoying if you pick her in the right situation, and Shaltir was just kind of bad to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I would put this collab, like, probably a bit above Overlord in terms of, like, how much they are going to impact the meta. I think we're going to see, like, a handful of of Silverias and maybe a few more Alicias because Alicia is actually pretty good once you get past her factions being a little bit limiting. Uh, and SR is useless, but you know it's like that's just, that's the curse of being SR. Uh, uh, but there isn't like I don't think there is a uh, there's no Kaiura or Himiko this time where where it's like oh this character is like really really crazy and is going to affect the meta pretty significantly uh, in the upcoming season. Uh, I think both of them are like both of them are threats for sure like I, I will say that like they will be units that you should be looking at while you're pick banning like you, you should be like aware of what they do uh, otherwise they can catch you off guard and make you lose like I, that's what I will say about them <laughs> yeah okay so, uh, so with that way I guess we can talk about this SP character they added uh, you know finally uh, Grenier, is, Grenier has been thrown Grenier. a bone. He has become <laughs> SP Grenier. Uh, so SP Grenier, uh, his Heart of Desire comes from a special map event. So it's kind of similar to like that event where they introduced Akka to the game, or like they introduced Akka okay. like on the story. It's like it's just like some random map events that appear, and then it's just like oh, it's like a little bit of story, and uh, and then at the end you will get uh, Grenier's Heart of Desire. Uh, I, I would say, like, so it's a little bit, I, it, it's a strange way of doing it, but I will say it's more elaborate than just plopping it down in, like, a, uh, what is it, uh, Forbidden Battleground shop, 
or just like giving it for free out from an event. So they actually did put like some story stuff this time for Grenier's SP class. Uh, okay. So SP Grenier, uh, first of all, I feel the need to point out he has no new factions. He's still glory only, which is just why <laughs> why would you do this so long? Uh, he, they really should have given him a second faction. Uh, I mean, he is a faction buffer, but it's kind of dumb that they didn't give him a second faction that would really would have helped him out. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, his SP class, once again, it's archer. Uh, it is like a, or a cavalry archer, basically. Uh, its stats are very similar. Or, or like uh, much higher the HP and defense are much higher than his original bowmaster class uh, they're still sli okay. slightly below his lancer class still but overall his stats are pretty good uh, you know high uh, high HP high defense uh, even like uh, high skill even uh, and his magic defense still is like like moderate uh, like his bowmaster class was so overall like you know pretty good stats uh, his, uh, his soldier boost did not change that much. He got some extra HP, uh, instead of out of his defense, and then his attack went up a little bit. So, you know, basically they're trying to make him a little bit more balanced with, uh, okay. the defense and the ma uh, magic tanking. Yeah. So his talent, uh, got a lot of things that people wanted for him to get. He still stacks himself up, like his original talent, but, uh... In addition okay. to the attack and defense boost, it also gives them a physical damage taken boost, uh, and they cannot be dispelled, which is huge. Like this is this is really huge. Uh, so you can get up to what is it? Thirty percent attack, thirty percent defense, and fifteen percent physical damage taken uh, reduction, uh, which is pretty like that's pretty strong. Like that's that's a lot of stats. Uh, I guess the first thing you'll notice is that he still doesn't have any sort of magic damage reduction or or even a magic defense boost, which kind of sucks. Oh yeah. Uh, but I mean, I guess that's not the worst thing. He does have Bolt Rangers still, which helps him tank magic a little bit. Uh, so when he has at least three buffs, he will not receive melee range penalties. So the three buffs, especially given how his uh, talent works now, three buffs is very very easy to maintain. So his melee range penalty. Uh, negation should will sh should be up like almost all the time, so that's that's yeah. good. So let's see here. Okay, so okay, we can talk about his two new skills. Uh, like with all SPs, he got a new one C and a new two C. Like the two C, I don't want to talk too much about because the two C I think is like kind of pointless. It's it's just like an AOE skill, and uh, I mean it's it's it sort of works with like the new gimmick he does. But most of the time, I don't think you're going to be using it because he is going to be bringing his faction buff most of the time, I feel like. To me, that's really the only reason you're using Grenier is that you are using some kind of glory box and you want the extra glory buff. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm sure there are some really, really rare situations where you might have Elwyn around and then you might be able to bring this, but I don't think that's necessary. And even in those situations, I think you, you might be better served by bringing Power Stab uh, as opposed to this. Okay. But I mean, this is still nice, but... Uh, th so this is like an AoE attack that also uh, makes it so that they do less damage to Grenier and take more damage from Grenier. Uh, and this is supposed to be combined with his new 1C, which is really... This is really the central new mechanic to his... Or like his central new gimmick, basically. So his new 1C basically says uh, after he takes action, if he has allies next to him, he will gain preemptive counterattack, which is like the the like the first strike counter skill he had uh, on his bowmaster class. So you don't need to bring that anymore. He'll just you know he can get it by just standing next to someone and he'll get it as a buff. He will get uh, a counter range increase equal to the number of allies he ends his turn next to. So obviously, in theory, you can end him next to four allies and he will have uh, a six range counter. Uh, okay, and it it can be seven range if you give him Uller's bow, but I don't think that's I don't think I would give him that. Uh, I would probably give him like I I mean you can give him Uller's bow like if you want like the safety net, but I think a lot of times like if you really want to lean into this gimmick, you might want to instead give him some kind of attack bow just to make sure he 
does more damage. Okay. Uh, or even or even crystal dagger, you know, crystal dagger works well with him as well. Yeah. Uh, although, like, you know, crystal dagger, do remember that you need to uh, have higher skill than your opponent to activate the crystal dagger. So that's something to always keep in mind. Uh, that shouldn't be, like, that shouldn't be too hard against the main targets you would want to catch with this, which is probably, like, mages. Uh, so, the big idea here, I think they're going for, is that Grenier would counter these long-range mages, like Light of Genesis and stuff. He would counter them for a ton of damage, and sometimes he would actually first strike and just kill them straight up before they do anything. That is, I think, what they were going for here. Uh, so, there's lots to talk about here. So basically, so first off, his preemptive counterattack, uh, just to review, if people don't re remember what it does, it is a 10% chance to first strike counter with a plus 1% chance for every 10 skill he has. Okay, so, but, but, but now I'm adding. So, he has 180 base skill on his new, on his new class. Uh, he will get like... I forgot what it was. It was like seventy skill from a bow, or like, or something like that, or or a dagger, uh, and then you can give him like the PVP skill stone. Uh, you can give him uh, the skill stone in his uh, like uh, mastery stone slots if you really want to. You can you can even equip uh, a skill accessory if you are so inclined. I mean, there is a uh, what is it called. Uh, Ah, oh, God, I forgot. I forgot what the the one the the one like skill increasing accessory was, the one that people liked using on Omega. Damn it, <laughs> slips my mind. But people know what I'm talking about. But I, but, but I wouldn't Oof. use that. But I wouldn't use that either way because I would probably I would probably recommend something like Overlord Badge or something on him instead, uh, or even like Judge Talisman if you want to hit like some holy unit really hard. Uh, but I, I think uh, I think Overlord Badge is probably best for him. Uh, if you want to maintain high attack, you get a little bit of skill from the all stats plus 5%. Uh, you're immune to Moby Down, which is important on a tank. Immune to attack and defense down, which is also very useful. Um, uh, you can, of course, use, like, Bracer, because, uh, you know, he gets power stab from his 3C guard skill, so. Uh, like, you can, you can stick to Bracer. You can use Blood Pact if you want to be immune to a heal block. Uh... Yeah, just the standard choices. So anyway, anyway, I was talking about his skill. So like, you can probably get him to like 400 skill uh, with a little bit of work. Uh, probably not too hard to get him to that level. So that's why I say like, you can get his preemptive counter strike to maybe around 50% uh, if you build him that way. So that's pretty good. Uh, I think most people would not risk the coin flip of attacking into him. Uh, yeah. Especially, especially if you like, if you're, if it's like a really well built grenier, he'll probably have really, really high attack, and he'll have, uh, he'll, he'll also have his helm active, his exclusive helm active, which is counter damage plus fifty percent, when he has at least seven buffs. So okay, so let's review. He has much higher base defense than his uh, original bowmaster class has. He can have like six or seven, like five, or like four to seven counter range, depending on how you, how you set him up. He can have a 50% chance to counter first before you hit him. Uh, he can have, uh, what is it? Uh, he'll get more defense from his talent stacks. Uh, he'll get plus 50% counter damage from his helm. And he'll have, because of his 3C, he will have power stab up. Uh, so he will convert his pretty high defense into some pretty big attack. Uh, he will counter first. If you're lucky, and he will counter with like plus like 50% damage or more. <laughs> so uh, the idea here is like I would save a lot of mages like Light of Genesis or even Lucretia. They are risking a lot by single target attacking into him. Uh, that's how good Grenier can be on paper. SP Grenier. Yeah, so, sounds pretty, so sounds pretty good, right? So okay, so now let's get into why I think that does not work at all, and why I think Espy Greener is a waste of your time. So, <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but like, I've, 
you know, I've been in a couple discussions about like whether or not we can, you can get SP Green Air to work, and I think you can, but the whole thing is that you have to maintain so many things to get Grenier to do that, right? You have yeah. to you have to maintain his power stab, which is not undispellable. They never made it undispellable from his 3C. Uh, you need to maintain like a lot of his you know, he's he's reliant on having that defense buff from his faction buff if you have it. He's reliant on having seven buffs to make sure his helm is active. Uh you know he gets some some of his skill uh, increases are also from his 3C. He gets yeah. uh, you know his new 1C the passive. It gives him preemptive counterattack and they increase counter range. But neither one of those is undispellable. So this is the big weakness of Grenier here, which is basically anybody that can dispel buffs on him because. Not only is he reliant on the number of buffs he has, but he is actually reliant on a good num like good number of them, a different number of them. So it's not like some situations where it's like juggler. Like juggler, for example, if you dispel his water, he he becomes a paper doll and he dies. Uh but that's like but if I was like if I was like sword souling into a juggler that had just used his 3C or something. He has like 15 buffs. Uh, I'm rolling the dice on whether or not I'm taking away his water buff and being able to break through him. He has all these other buffs, and like all these other buffs might, might also might help him survive. With Grenier, it's like I'm not only I'm relying on power stab, I'm relying on the skill increase, I'm relying on the counter range increase, I'm relying I'm relying on the preemptive counter strike, I'm relying on the fact that I have at least seven buffs so I can counter for 50% extra damage. Uh, the two the like the tenacity stacks I got from his talents cannot be dispelled, so that actually narrows the amount of buffs that will be dispelled if you hit him with some kind of dispel character. Uh, so obviously the answer to this people will come up with is like, okay, just ban those characters. Then ban ban Elwin, ban Waitam, ban Iron Chancellor, uh, and hope your opponent doesn't have a bunch of Vidar's roses and annoys the shit out of you. Uh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> and uh that's the thing. Like, sure, sure. Like, I mean, I mean, it, I mean, that's that's how big band works, right? You get rid of the things that counter your units, and that's fine. But my problem with Grenier is that yes, you can ban all those guys, but then you run into the other problem, which is that once again, he's a tank, and he doesn't have an aura, he doesn't have AOE reduction of any kind, he doesn't stop assassins in any way. So you are actually you're not facing off against one problem for me you're actually facing off against three in a pick ban situation you are facing off against enemies that can dispel his buffs and disable his main role of countering these long range units you are facing off against aoe units that just ignore grenier and just do whatever you are facing off against assassins who will just ignore grenier and do whatever now obviously this is not a one-way street like Against AOE, you can pick like Elma or something, because like Glory Faction, okay, you have Elma. You know, you can you can pick Elma and like she will save you against the AoEs or something. And or even Rosen if you're lucky enough to get her. But so But to me it's like when you pick when you pick ban, like you want units that have that like open up your pick ban less than they <laughs> narrow it down. Uh it feels like Grenier is one of those units that makes your pick ban incredibly narrow when you are thinking of using him. Now, that's not to say that I think Grenier is useless, because he's still a faction buffer, he's still a tank that has a lot of movement, and I think he can survive a lot of big hits, because between his uh, physical damage reduction, uh, his pretty good stats, and his like his access to like bolt rangers and stuff, and the fact that he can move 5 or even 6 spaces if you give him boots, like all those things are useful. Like, uh, like, I think he can still... That's why I, I don't think, like, Grenier is completely useless. Like, I think he does have a niche. But when when you talk about this, like, this ability he has to counter mages to death or counter even, like, I guess an archer to death if you run into one. Yeah. I just feel like you need to maintain so many different things at the same time to be able to make him be able to do that. And it's so easy to disrupt or just outright ignore. Uh, even the the units that you can think of, like, uh, what is it, Lucretia, that's, like, that's the biggest mage right now, right, that's the most, that's the most, 
common mage you see on teams. Yes. Uh, Lucretia, she's just going to bring Black Hole. <laughs> like, I mean, yes, you, you, yes, like, if you, okay, you ban out, you ban out, like, all these buff dispellers, you ban out Console of the Moon, you ban out Iron Chancellor, you ban out Elwyn, you ban out, like, Wei Tam. Like, obviously not every single box you run into is going to have every single one of them, but you're, you're going to run into some combination of these really strong single target units that can dispel buffs, uh, AoE units that can mostly just ignore Grineer, uh, or Assassins that can mostly just ignore Grineer. Uh, you know, you're going to be dealing with some kind of combination of those three things in any given box. And I feel like you're really fighting an uphill battle in terms of getting Grineer to the point where he is able to do that one thing that he can do, which is counter mages to death. I mean, I'm sure we'll see two or three like a couple a handful of replays at some point where somebody gets it to work like i can see that happening it's just that i feel like esper grenier requires so much support yeah uh, but you, all just just sp stuff in general to get an sp that too there's that too yeah like just i'm talking about like support like in in like actual gameplay but yeah there's also the fact that like there's also the cost of like 500 challenge points, yeah. something like that. There's also the cost of getting in the first place, right? That's also... Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, overall, like, I, I kind of feel like I've already gone over a lot of what there is to say about Grineer. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't want to dismiss him outright, because I do think he has a lot going for him. And, uh, you know, it's cool, like, it's cool that he tried something unique with his care with the kit here. And, uh, also, he looks pretty cool. Like I like, I like his new outfit and his new sprite is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do like it. It's a crossbow. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I will like. I do think in, and I've said this in the past. Like, I think like if you play a ton of glory characters, then yeah, like I think you can use Grenier and he'll be pretty useful, but not for this one narrow gimmick that is probably not going to factor into like ninety percent of games you're playing. Uh, you are probably bringing him. To be to be a backup glory faction buff, and he is tanky enough to take uh, a fair number of hits. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty like with bolt rangers and this physical damage reduction. Like, I think it would be pretty difficult for most uh, tank busters to kill him. I think yeah. I think he can take at least two hits before dying. And uh, I guess what I guess that's another problem is that he does not have a revive. They did not give him a revive of any kind, which kind of sucks. Like that's, it almost feels standard on tanks at this point to have a revive of some kind, but they didn't give that to Grineer. Uh, I guess the last thing I really feel the need to mention is that this this long range counter thing. Uh, when we're talking about PVE, I always think of those really annoying vampire enemies on some of the PVE maps that have like twelve range or whatever, yeah. <laughs> and it's like. You gave Grenier like this extra range, but you didn't give him the ability to counter those guys because those are the most annoying long range enemies in PVE content. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's uh, it's, that's kind of a it's a nitpick, I guess. But it's just like I, I kind of wish they, they had considered that. Uh, oh yeah, I guess another thing about the, the setting up the range thing is that you need to stand next to a number of units to be able to increase his range for that amount. So you need, like, think about that from, like, in a, like a gameplay perspective. That means I need to run my units out front, like, yeah. in a, like, line them up for Grenier before I can move Grenier up to them and then, like, have them be under guard. It's just like, it's... Like when you think about it, it's just like, oh, it's that it actually makes it very inconvenient. It makes it harder for me to advance on my opponent. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess the last thing is that uh, the new soldier they gave him is the ballistas, which is which is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I guess I guess there wasn't really much else they could have given him. They do give him extra normal attack range, so he can counter even further, and they have. A lot of attack themselves so uh he can counter harder with these guys uh that is one nice thing but you know you're probably bringing him to be a tank so uh i would not like most of the time i don't think using siege ballistas is a good idea i think yeah. it is probably better also they, they they stunt his movement which is like one of the big advantages of using grenier uh 
So I think most of the time you're still going to be sticking to like Elven Cavalry Archers or the Bolt Rangers. Bolt Rangers are of course the tanky option and Elven Cavalry Archers, like they're usually not active for Grineer because his 3C puts him on a city wall instead of a forest or a grassland. <laughs> they, didn't, okay. they, didn't, they didn't really think that one through. But, uh, you know, you know, Elven Cavalry Archers, they, they maintain Grineer's movement while also having some attacks, so... Yeah. Whatever. Uh, yeah, that's... I think that's about all I have to say. Anything you want to add here? I want to get the item, but I'm not going to use it. <laughs> Yeah, like we we did touch on that briefly, which is like there's there is also that whole aspect of SP classes are really expense are actually really expensive to to get through. You know, it's like they're like what is it like? I forgot how many total, but it's like two hundred uh, challenge points total, possibly more. I forgot the total amount. Uh, you know, you need to give. All kinds of class upgrade items, which might be a problem for some like earlier game players. They're still trying to up, like master class all their, uh, their units. You need two rune stones, rune stones which are very valuable to like mid game or early game players. Uh, and that's really one of the big downsides here, right? Because like you have this, you have this upgrade to a freebie character, and uh, you would think that it's like okay, it might be nice for newcomers. Because he's like a free six star character, and you can upgrade him to like this up like this more powerful version. But it's all like, but it's like, it, I almost feel like investing into Grenier is a trap for those players. Uh, you will probably regret putting those kind of that kind of resource uh, investment into him. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to getting a like a an exclusive for a unit that you were sharding up. Or uh, rune stoning another unit you were start sharding up, because uh, down the line you're you know, unless you are playing pure glory, like I said, like if you're playing nothing but glory, then yeah, he's, yeah, get get him sure that it's like uh, down the line you are going to stop using your engineering account. Kind of, you might regret putting all those resources into him, and and that's opposed to like say Freya, who I feel like if you SP Freya. Like she's still gonna be useful. Like, I think as, like Freya is like endlessly useful if you SP her. Because and you don't even have to SP her, but I'm saying like like investing into SP Freya is a better investment if you are going to put that kind of investment down on any unit, uh, like a SR unit or a freebie unit. Because uh, not only is Freya just like a really good uh, origin faction tank. Uh, but she's also like just eternally useful because of fixed damage stages. <laughs> Grenier is like Grenier's fine. Like I, I mean, I, I I know I like I kind of critiqued a lot of his kit here, uh, but like I said, I still think he's like decent, and he can be really good in certain boxes. But I do think uh, there are some people who are looking at his kit and being like, oh, he has this really powerful aspect to his new kit. But it's like, yeah, but it's really hard to set up. It's really hard to maintain. Uh, and even if you do, a lot of times your opponent is not going to bring... Uh, they're just going to bring AoEs on their mages anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's like... Some, like, like yeah, there, there are going to be situations where you can get Grinier to work in that capacity. But I think most of the time you should more be looking him, at him as like this high mobility tank that can faction buff glory like i think that's his main appeal and not so much this like this weird like long range counter gimmick uh it's it's a nice bonus on top like you know it's, it's nice to be able to threaten your opponent with that but uh i don't think it's going to come into play uh in like the majority of games kind of a broken record but like uh you know if you're a fan of grenier or if you play a lot of glory, then yeah, go ahead. You know, I don't think it's like a total waste to get SP Grenier. I think he's fine. I think he can still be decent. But I think it, yeah. for, for anybody else, I think like he is not someone you should really be looking at. He's not going to be doing anything super useful. And you you should be like slightly aware of what he does because you, you don't want to be caught off guard and be like have someone post onto YouTube that one replay where you're embarrassed because you lost to SP Grenier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, these two exclusives they added for this patch, which is Kruger and Transcender. 
Uh, I feel like both of these are pretty boring. Uh, Kruger's is basically uh, when he dies, he will... Uh, when he dies, he basically does like similar to his 3C, where like, well, he doesn't do the damage, but he replace within five blocks of himself, two buffs are replaced with random debuffs. So it's just more like debuff shit coming out of Kruger. Uh, I think it works okay with Kruger because a lot of times Kruger is played in a YOLO fashion, where you you set up his 3C and then the next turn you put up a shield and then just charge in and do his 3C or his uh, Dragon Breath or whatever. Uh, so if you're this is just like basically a final punishment to your opponent if they want to kill Kruger, they will get you know just another two buffs yeah. to spells and another two debuffs. Uh, I think it works. I think it's good. Uh, the question is, of course, that this being a helm, uh, how does this compare with Tenyo's? Uh, I some people feel like you know you're still going to use Tenyo's. Me personally, I feel like if you are playing a very very aggressive game, I yeah. would act, I would use this because yeah, I would I would say that too. Just the fact that if he does in fact die, just screw your phone even more. <laughs> yeah, it's not just that, but it's like when you're comparing it to Tenyo's specifically. The thing about Tenyo's is that uh, it gets better the longer a, a map is uh, a fight is going on, right? Because you can just stand back and just like end turn and hope it gives you the buff you need. Uh, but if it's if you're going for like a super aggressive strategy where you're just got like you're going you're only going to set up for like one or two turns and then just charge in, then yeah. I would def I would go with this because it's more consistent, it's more reliable. Uh, Tenyo's headdress is like. You know, you're, you're praying for that 1 in 7 chance for the uh, for the Breeze. And I know some people argue that, well, Kruger does, like, the shield makes him act again, so he actually does it twice on that turn. And not entirely, because, like, if you... Okay, so for short, like, the first turn where you use his 3C to tag the opponent, uh, you're going to get a 10 year activation. And then maybe the second turn when you put up the shield, you are next to someone before you engage, and you will get another 10 year uh, tenure activation out of that but uh, after that you're charging in so you're probably not next to anybody anymore so you're not getting you're actually not getting that second activation most of the time and sometimes you might not even get that first activation if you move the full range for the first yeah. move while, before you put up the shield so I feel like uh, uh, like I said in a very very aggressive play uh, this helm is better than Tenyo's in my opinion uh, I mean, Tenyo's is always going to be a wild card, right? You're always going to be, like, you know, sometimes you're going to get that one Tenyo Breeze that helps you win the game, but it's like, eh. Uh, I, I would stick with this if if you if you are playing aggressive, uh, which is, I think, I feel like is most games nowadays. And, like, out of the debuff characters, uh, Kruger is one of the more aggressive ones. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, not a lot to say there. So Transcender... Uh, so this helm is uh, <laughs> uh, once again you're comparing it with Tenyo's, right? And I would say, like in this case, it's a little bit harder to determine because Transcender is less aggressive uh, compared to someone like Kruger. Uh, Transcender is an AOE, and then he has like single target attacks uh, or his normal attack attacks twice. So. This helm makes his double attack stronger by giving him damage dealt plus 15%. And uh, it also makes it easier for him to stack his talent, which was something he had a little bit of trouble with before. Uh, he will get one stack before he enters battle. And he also steals three buffs using his 3C now, which is actually pretty useful. I feel like if you were using Transcender to begin with, you would use this helm. Because if you were using Transcender to begin with, you are looking to... Uh, take advantage of his 3c that exchanges his hp with the opponent uh and you want to like uh, use his double attack a little bit as well i feel like because of that this helm is still worth using over tenyo's because if you are picking transcender you're kind of like you you put him in your box with the consideration that you are going to use that 3c uh to some extent so this does improve the 3c quite significantly i feel like uh stealing three buffs is pretty good and uh you know the attack uh, you know the single target attack afterwards 
can probably uh, help you ensure to kill by getting extra damage. And of course, you stack up your talent easier, which was kind of annoying with him before. You had to before you had to either use like his one C AOE to like just attack at attack at air, <laughs> or bring uh, his strength and skill. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and like he had to stack up, he stacks up to three times, which usually he didn't have time to do. Uh, now uh, you can still do that. You can still get the one stack from you know casting a skill at, on their first turn. And then, uh, you know, if, if you engage, you'll have two stacks, you know, you'll have the extra intelligence. Uh, basically, this is this helm is more useful if you are someone who really likes using his 3C to annoy your opponent. You know, just, like, punish them for AoEing you or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Like, I mean, Tenyo's, like, it really comes down to, like, how you play. Uh, Tenyo's is always a big wild card, as I said. Uh... But I personally would go with this with this helm. Okay, I still don't have him, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I have. I actually do have a six star transcender on my Chinese account, so I've played with him a little bit. Uh, you know, transcender is still he's 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 a pretty strange character. He's like a he's a tanky mixed DPS character that does both single target and AOE, and then he also has this weird like HP exchanging ability and this shield. Like he he's kind of he's a really interesting unit to play around with. And I think, like, that's why I like this helm, because it kind of, like, it kind of improves, like, his gimmicks, which is the main reason you're running him. Like, you're running him for his unique qualities and not so much because you just want him to be another generic AoE mage. But that's, okay. my, that's my take on it, at least. Yeah. So, yeah, not a lot to say about the exclusive this time. They're, they're pretty much just, like, generic boosts to the units that they were given to. Uh, they're competing against Tenyos, like, like they so often do, but... Uh, you know, you, you would think that for once they would, like, add a robe or something to make it. <laughs> or they want people to, like, compare it to Tenyo's and, like, make decisions, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so... I mean, it's also the point of... You might not have all the Tenyo's that you need. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. So, which is which is nice for people who have been unlucky with the drops. Uh, so, okay, so... I got, we can talk about the, co the new Covenant they added this patch real quick, which is Balder. Uh, so... Let me just like uh, copy paste. I'll just put, paste it in the chat window real, real quick. This is the this is the hero stat bonus uh, that Balder gives in comparison to the other three covenants that we already have. So as you can see here, uh, Balder is slightly tankier than Thor, uh, or like it makes your units slightly tankier than Thor in terms of HP and defense. Uh, you get less attack but more intelligence. So what I'm seeing here is uh, for people who like using Freya, when when you're when you're like when you get like Kyura as your carry or whatever, you you sometimes switch to Freya so that you can ensure kills. Yeah. If you want to sacrifice a little bit of intelligence to get like that bulk back from when you uh, if you preferred like the bulk from Thor, uh, I think this is like kind of an in between choice between like Freya and Thor, where it's like. I can have a lot of the intelligence from Freya, but I also can still keep a lot of the defensive uh, defensive bonuses that I had from Thor. That's really what I'm seeing here. So even though it looks like kind of a kind of a weird random spread of stats here, I actually do think it actually has its own niche uh, in terms of PvP, like as far as the stat spread goes. Uh, so yeah, that's that's all I have to say about Baldir. But like. All it, okay. As it is with any other covenants, like you can stick with, like if you have been falling behind and you haven't stuck with your covenants, like you can, you can stick with Thor and you're usually safe most of the time. Thor is a nice balanced option, and he's a safe option. Like you know, you can just stick with Thor most of the time and you'll be fine. But like raising all the other covenants is just, uh, yeah, it's just it's just to give you some some uh, some options in case you really want to. Okay, okay. so Balder himself as a summon. Uh, yeah, in case you care about it. So Baldur is centered around cooldowns, basically. So, you know, we have Thor, who was, like, centered around, like, fixed damage, basically. Uh, Freya gives you bonuses to, like, mages, and uh, she, like, increases, like, your range. Uh, Heimdall gives you, like, damage shields, and then, like, boosts one guy really strong, like, at the end. So Baldur, uh, what he does is that, uh, uh, First of all, when you summon him, 
he will immediately reduce the cooldowns of everybody that gets hit. So he like uh, hit the summon drop down, it, it targets allies instead of enemies, uh, like with Baldur, or like with Heimdall. So instead of giving everybody like a damage shield or whatever, he just reduces everybody's cooldowns, uh, and up to three turns of cooldown. He can reduce up to a total of, of 40 turns. Uh, that's his max. So he's, he gets summoned with 40 stacks of a buff that says like, okay, you consume one of these every time you reduce a cooldown by one. So when you use a skill near Baldur, you'll get a stack of a Shining Aura. So he's, once again, it's like a stacking buff. So you stack up uh, Baldur's stacks by using skills near him, and he gets more stacks if it's a long cooldown skill. And he will also like reduce the cooldowns on it as well. So like all the other covenants, he has two main skills that he uses once you drop him down. The first one is an assist skill, which is like you buff your allies and then they get extra damage for every one turn of cooldown on the skills. So kind of like Licorice's faction buff. Uh, so it gives damage dealt plus 18% for every one turn of cooldown on the skill up to 90%. So five turn cooldown skills will get plus 90% damage, which is pretty strong. And then... Uh, so you'll be you'll use this first to power up your ally skills, and then you start using skills around him. He'll start stacking up because you're burning all these cooldowns, and then you and then he uses his finisher, which is a magic attack, uh, two times damage, and then does AOE within two blocks of that target for 0.25 times of the damage dealt as fixed damage. And then okay. each stack he had from your all your allies using skills will get plus one percent fixed damage up to fifty percent. So, uh, so yeah, like he he does function pretty similarly to a lot of the other covenants, where he powers up your allies, uh, and then he has some kind of big finisher move, uh, like that is based on like if you stack them up properly. I will say like he is probably he is possibly the easiest one to use so far because Thor required you to have fixed damage, which you might not necessarily have. You might not have a bunch of people with Ragnarok. Freya required you to have a bunch of long-range units, which you might not necessarily have, or you needed to like load out a specific team. Heimdall was pretty easy to use because Heimdall, like, you just need to heal near him. Uh, Baldur, uh, he is not picky about what skills you use. You just need to have a bunch of long cooldown skills, or just or you don't even need to use long cooldown skills if you don't want to. But you know, just uh, just use skills near him, and he'll be stacking up, uh, and then he'll be able to use his finisher move. So. That's all there is to say. Like the covenants are all structured pretty similarly in how they function. Uh, I think I don't think Baldur is going to be a favored. Uh, I, I guess it varies. I, I think it really varies, but I don't think Baldur is going to be a favored covenant for like chasing ancient beckoning high scores and stuff. I believe right now Heimdall is the one that people use the most because his okay. like his like his like one ally. Like buff skill can be stacked to a ridiculous level <laughs> and, wow. make, and become really really strong and then you just use like like some crazy skill crazy strong skill with the one uh with all the stacked power from heimdall and uh make sure that the ancient beckoning boss is knocked out so that they take extra damage uh so i don't think bald i don't think balder is going to replace heimdall in that sense but uh you know like he does have a different niche. Like it, they did a good job of like making sure all these covenants have a slightly different function, so you can play around with it. Okay, so not much else to say. Uh, so the floating city, uh, they seem to be slowing down their additions right now because the last patch I can think of, like uh, which is the uh, uh, Azusa and Oboro patch, and I think this this newest patch as well, which is uh, Carolian and Kagura. Uh, both of those patches, I don't think, had any like new additions to the floating city that were like significant. But anyway, this is the. But anyway, they added a fortune cat for this patch, which uh, the uh, Valkyria Chronicles patch. And this is also a pretty insignificant building, honestly, because all this does is increase the gold you get from buildings. That's it. Uh, okay. Nothing too special. I mean. You'll probably go get it just because, like, whatever, more gold. That's nice. <laughs> but it's like uh, nothing much to say here. Okay, so let's finish it off. We got some content. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, the Valkyria Chronicles event. I don't have a lot to say here. Like, you know, it's like it's just the standard collab uh, content, uh, Secret Realm event 
uh, it is a points event, as I recall. And, uh, you know, there's a story. So it's not like you, Hakusho, where they didn't have a story. So they had a story. That's nice. Uh, not much else to say. So uh, <laughs> they're rerunning auto chess again because I guess they hate us. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sure there are some people who enjoy Magic Towers. Uh, usually, I just like I just I just clear the, the I clear the quest and then I just like drop the mode because I don't I don't enjoy the mode very much at all. Like it's fun. I mean, it's fun like a couple times, but then you have to play it so much and then it's just like eh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I, I yeah I just I clear the quest and then like I drop the mode. Some people enjoy mm -hmm. it. But yeah, uh, I guess the last thing they added for this patch is uh, this Time Rift 22. So Time Rift 22, Ooh, uh, 22, the big item, the big treasure item in this one is a Blood Sword Hunting. So it's in 22-3. Uh, they gave out a free Fury of Tear in Time Rift. I think it was 21, or was it one of the story modes? I forgot. But like they gave out a free Fury of Tear at one point. But it's like. Uh, this one is a little bit less impressive, Bloodsword Hunting, but I do know there are quite a few players who have been very unlucky with Bloodsword and they don't have a single one and they really, really want one for uh, Helena. So, uh, if by the time this time rift comes out, you still don't have one for Helena, uh, or or even like whatever AoE unit you want, because like some people equip it on like Leon Hard, some people even equip it on like yeah. some people equip it on like Juggler actually. Some I've seen people equip it on like Cav Juggler and it can actually be pretty useful. Okay. Uh, some people put it on Bernhardt, which is like, I mean, you get really teeny tiny range if you put it on Bernhardt, but it can be pretty good. Um, yeah. I believe that's all we have to talk about today. So that's the Valkyra Chronicles collab, guys. Uh, it's, yeah, kind of a... I don't want to say underwhelming, because like, like, it's pretty standard collab. Like, it, like it, this, they, they're not really doing anything different than they've always done. I think most people are only disappointed because they're not super busted. Uh, which see, I don't want to see, see. I don't want to be in like that situation where I'm saying like these guys aren't busted enough because I really don't want them to add characters that are too busted. And uh, I do think they're slightly underpowered, especially Silveria. I think Alicia is fine. Like I, th I think Alicia is around the place that I think uh, is fine for a collab unit. She's pretty good. Uh, but I do understand that some people want collab characters to be busted, if only because. They are more affected by power creep than a lot of other units are because they don't get as many buffs to them after the fact compared to the Langrister characters. Uh, that's that's one of the only like like that's one of the only arguments I understand like that makes sense to me. But uh, yeah, I don't have a lot to say about aside from that. Uh, anything final you want to add here, Frontier? I mean, to me, it's just a normal patch that's, that's going to come and go. I didn't see anything really seeing special except like Alicia from the uh, Valkyrie Chronicles just because my friend plays it, but besides that, mm, me. Well, uh, okay, just uh, let us know in the comments below if you like prefer them to add like really OP characters during collabs or like what do you think of the Valkyria, collabs chron uh, Valkyria Chronicles collab? Uh, are you disappointed? Are you happy about it? Uh, do you, did you wish that they went a little bit further with the characters? Uh, but whatever the case, uh, thanks for joining me again today, Frontier. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Yep, see you. Bye.